Welcome to STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. Welcome to STEM Talk, where we introduce you to fascinating people who passionately inhabit the scientific and technical frontiers of our society. Hi, I'm your host, Don Carnegis, and joining me to introduce today's podcast is IHMC Director Dr. Ken Ford, also known as the Chairman of the Double Secret Selection Committee that selects all the guests to appear on STEM Talk. Hi, Don. Great to be here with you. Uh, we had a really great time talking with Dr. Claire Frazier about genomics and the gut microbiome. Yeah, I really enjoyed talking with Claire, and her passion for her work in genomics really shines through. And her research on the impact of antibiotics on the gut is so relevant to medical issues that we're facing today. Yes, she is wonderful. And her talk at IHMC was super well received by an overflow crowd. Mm-hmm. Before we get to today's interview with Claire, though, we do have some housekeeping to take care of. First, we really appreciate all of you who have subscribed to STEM Talk, and we are especially appreciative of all the wonderful five star reviews positively piling up on iTunes. As we announced in several earlier episodes, the Double Secret Selection Committee has been continually and carefully reviewing the iTunes reviews with an eye toward selecting the wittiest and most lavishly praise-filled reviews to read on STEM Talk. As always, if you hear your review read on STEM Talk, just contact us at stemtalk at ihmc.us to claim your official STEM Talk t-shirt. It's a cool shirt, and we love to send them out. Absolutely. Today, our winning review was posted by someone who goes by the nickname J. Greg V. And the winning review is entitled Intellectually Stimulating. And here's the winning review. This is by far the most intellectually stimulating podcast that is out there. There are a lot of podcasts that provide great information. But if you want one that not only makes you think, but puts you in the mood to do additional research, then this is the podcast for you. Not only are the hosts of the podcast experts in their fields and walking encyclopedias of knowledge, the guests on the show are experts in their fields. Well, thank you, J. Greg V., and thank you to all the other STEM Talk listeners who have helped STEM Talk get off to such a great start. We really appreciate all of you. Okay, now on to today's interview with Claire Fraser. Claire Fraser is a pioneer and global leader in genomic medicine and one of the most highly cited investigators in microbiology. She earned her bachelor's degree in biology at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute and her PhD in pharmacology at State University of New York, Buffalo. She is currently a professor of medicine at the University of Maryland. In 2007, she launched the Institute for Genome Sciences at the University of Maryland. From 1998 to 2007, she was the director of the Institute for Genomic Research in Rockville, Maryland, leading teams that sequenced the genomes of several microbial organisms, including important human and animal pathogens. In 1995, she became the first person to map the complete genetic code of a free-living organism, Haemophilus influenza bacterium that causes lower respiratory tract infections, and meningitis in infants and young children. This discovery forever changed microbiology and launched a new field of study, microbial genomics. During this time, she and her team also sequenced bacteria behind syphilis and Lyme disease, and eventually the first plant genome and the first human pathogenic parasite. She even helped identify the source of a deadly 2001 anthrax attack in one of the biggest investigations conducted by U.S. law enforcement. Her current research centers on the structure and function of the human gut microbiota. She has authored more than 320 scientific publications, edited three books, and has served on committees of the National Science Foundation, the Department of Energy, and National Institutes of Health, among others. STEM Talk. 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 Hi, I'm Dawn Carnegis, and I'd like to welcome our guest today, Claire Fraser, to the podcast. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. And also joining us is Dr. Ken Ford. Ken, welcome. Good to be here, Dawn, and uh, I'll second your welcome to Claire. Absolutely. So, Claire, tell us a little bit about your upbringing and how that influenced your career. Wow, I wasn't expecting that question. How how interesting. Um, I, I grew up in... A uh, suburb of Boston. Both of my parents were educators, believed passionately in the value of public education. And for a long time, I thought I would follow in their footsteps until I took my first biology course as a freshman in high school. 
And I was so fortunate to have a teacher who was passionate and excited about his subject. And from that point on, it was clear to me that I was going to do something in the field of science. I thought that meant medical school for a long time. But then when I was in college, I had a chance to do research as an undergraduate. And that really pretty much set my the, my trajectory um, for the rest of my career. And I've... Um, I've had lots of opportunities and taken them and um, ended up in what I consider to be a great place in, in terms of being able to do research. It's like getting paid to uh, have fun. Yep, I agree. Mm. <laughs> um, so tell us about what, what led you to study microbiology specifically. Well, that was actually a rather roundabout route. Um, I, I, my, my project in college was actually in microbiology. But I went on to graduate school and started working on a class of proteins in vertebrates, G-protein coupled receptors. They're very important in cell-to-cell communication. Um, And then I moved to the NIH at the time when automated DNA sequencing was just getting started. And that turned out to be a great approach to try and find new members of this big protein family. And I thought that I would do that for the rest of my career. But then the opportunity presented itself to apply some of these large-scale DNA sequencing technologies to try and see if we could sequence um, the genome of a simple bacterial cell. And it was a really cool project. And I had the opportunity to be involved. And I thought it would be a temporary diversion, and I'd go back to my receptor work. Mm -hmm. But That never happened, and uh, so that was back in the mid-90s, and I've been involved in microbial genomics ever since. Uh, In the past, you have noted that there are more microbes on your hand than there are people on the planet. In a sense, humans can be thought of as a kind of superorganism in which we and our microbes have a complex codependent relationship which affects nearly all aspects of wellness and human performance, including the expression of our genes. To provide us some background for our conversation and some some context, could you give us the short course version of Intro to Microbiome 101? <laughs> yeah, I'll do my best, although um, it's, it's a fairly complex topic, but I think we can simplify it. Uh, I, th- I think... One thing we don't really consider is that we as human beings represent a complex ecosystem. We're host to these communities of trillions of microbial cells, many thousands of bacterial and fungal species, lots and lots of viruses and phage. And um, we live with our microbial partners every day of our lives. We are born reasonably sterile, although there's some debate on that, but it's thought that we inherit the microbes that will colonize us at birth from our mothers. And these communities expand and change throughout the course of a lifetime. Um, They're very dynamic. Um, Almost every external factor that we can think of influences the structure and function of these communities. And they're not um, passive um, riders with us. They are very much involved in helping us to maintain health. And there's growing evidence to suggest that a long list of diseases, particularly chronic diseases, may be associated with changes in these microbial communities. But what I've always found helpful in my own research and what I think perhaps is helpful in thinking about what all of this means is to really consider Um, this an ecosystem. And if you ask people, well, think of an ecosystem, people might say, oh, well, a rainforest or a coral reef. And I think the idea of an ecosystem is, is pretty well understood. It's a collection of organisms that interact, that are codependent, and that's a perfect analogy to the human microbiome. So, Claire, one of the most well-known microbes is Lactobacillus rhamnosus GG, otherwise known as LGG. And so I know that this strain of bacteria is really popular in probiotics and has been noted as being a helpful microbe. Can you tell us about the role that it plays in the gut specifically? Sure. Um, 
most of the probiotics that are available that we can find in the dairy section in the supermarket or on in various aisles in in the pharmacy um, are organisms that have been known for many hundreds of years. They were originally exploited for their ability to ferment dairy products and and other products and and they were used really as a way to preserve food before there was refrigeration. But then it was noted back at the turn of the 20th century that populations around the world that con- consumed a lot of these probiotic fermented products oftentimes um, had uh, longer lifespans and perhaps healthier lifespans. I, some of the listeners may be far too young to remember this, but I remember one of the first commercials on TV for Dan and Yogurt showed Somebody from Eastern Europe who looked to be well over 100 years old sitting there eating Dan and yogurt, suggestion being that yogurt somehow was contributing to longevity. And there, there may be something to that. Um, but it, and a lot of these probiotic organisms originally were derived from the human gut microbiome. And the science behind probiotics is really just getting started using the new tools of genomics to really try and understand how these organisms contribute to human health. We've published a study on this, and we have other work underway that suggests that LGG, a well-known probiotic, might impact human health through its ability to modulate the effects of other members of the gut microbiome. It may have effects directly on on humans. Um, We didn't study that specifically, Um, but we now have the tools um, to begin to try and tease apart the ways in which these probiotic organisms, which have been assumed to be beneficial for so long, are actually having their effect. You know, more and more I see researchers, including yourself, thinking of the microbes in the gut as part of a complex, interconnected ecosystem, as you just mentioned. If that is the case, and I'm sure it is, what are the implications then for the subject of probiotics in terms of their potential efficacy and uh, application in humans? Well, I think one of the things that is starting to become clear when we further explore the impact of of probiotics on this complex ecosystem of organisms that lives in the gut is that the ecosystem in each of us is is not identical. Um, The same high-level functions are probably being carried out um, in all of us. That's how these, that's how the gut microbiome contributes to health. But like so many other ecosystems that we might think about, um, even if you move a few hundred yards away from one place to another, the overall organization, the membership in these ecosystem communities may be different, and that matters. So one of the, I think one of the most interesting findings that came out of the earliest work in studying the human microbiome is the tremendous amount of inter-individual variability. We are all very different in the microbes that we carry. And even in a given individual, the composition and the function of those microbes changes over the course of a lifetime. So given that, I think one of the things that we are, we have uh, have hints at now, and we're going to see um, confirmed as more studies are completed, is that a given probiotic like LGG is unlikely to have an identical effect if it's introduced into ecosystems that aren't identical. We don't have any problem accepting that when we think about um, how prescription drugs, say, work when given to a population of individuals. We know in some individuals a given drug will be of great benefit, in others it may have no effect whatsoever, and in some individuals it, it may cause an adverse effect. So I think one of the challenges in probiotic science um, is going to be to see whether or not we can figure out what composition of the microbiome, specifically which individuals will benefit by taking a particular probiotic, and in other cases when that same probiotic may may provide little or no benefit. 
Yeah, so the personalized medicine approach, but exactly the personalized medicine approach to probiotics. So Claire, you're known internationally for your role in genome sequencing and adopting next gen sequencing technologies um, for pathogen evolution. Can you tell us about what led you to launch the Institute of Genomics at the University of Maryland? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, my Many of my colleagues who I'm still working with and I um, were part of a previous organization, the Institute for Genomic Research. It was um, an independent research organization similar to IHMC in some respects. And I think we, we were in a fantastic situation to have the opportunity to exploit the new tools that came from the genomics revolution to the study of microbial life on Earth. We looked at human pathogens, plant and animal pathogens, um, microbes that were isolated from extreme environments. And I think it helped to really rewrite the book on microbial diversity on Earth. Um, but we were somewhat isolated in that situation, and um, it became clear I was one of the I was one of the people um, who began to become very interested in the application of these technologies in the field of biomedicine. And, and in order to do those studies, we really needed access to clinician collaborators and clinical samples. And it isn't that you can't carry out these kinds of collaborations long distance. We all do it all the time. But there's nothing like being in close physical proximity to your collaborators. It really does enable a lot of, you know, even offhand conversations that can lead to interesting new ideas. So a group of us back 10 years ago started to think that maybe it was time for a change to really expand our horizons. And, and we began to look around, and the University of Maryland School of Medicine had just finished a strategic plan. Genomics was one of the pillars of that plan for their research agenda going forward. So it was a great example of being in the right place at the right time, and um, an opportunity was was provided for an, uh, 50 of my colleagues and I to go to the University of Maryland and, and create this new Genomics Institute, which we did, and it's it's been a wonderful move. Uh, did you uh, have the opportunity to collaborate with Elicio Fasano when you and he were together at Maryland? I did have the opportunity to collaborate with Elicio, and in fact, I'm still collaborating with him. Um, we're in a second five years of funding um, on a project to look at the intersection between the gut immune system and the gut microbiota in the context of immunization against enteric pathogens. Um, he's been a fabulous collaborator. He's so full of ideas and energy um, that I'm always inspired when I have the opportunity to uh, sit down and talk with him. Absolutely. We understand that and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> feel the same way about him. Mutual respect. Yeah. <laughs> um, so can you tell us about your journey from being involved in the first completed genome sequencing that, from what I understand, took about 18 months mm -hmm. to where current technologies stand today? When we tackled the first microbial genome project, which was back, it started in 1994, early 1994, the paper was published in Science in the middle of 1995. It was, by all measures, a grand experiment. Mm -hmm. We we had the tools to do automated sequencing, but um, you know, compared to what we can do today, um, it was really very primitive. We, we, I remember our first full year of genome sequencing after we had founded the Institute for Genomic Research, we had processed just over 101,000 samples in a year. And we really had a late push so we could break the 100,000 barrier. Um, Today, um, the technology has continued to evolve to the point where we could we could sequence the same number of samples. Um, well, it would actually represent a fraction of a sequencing run. This now we're talking about 101,000 samples in a matter of minutes. Um, the cost has come down um, faster than than Moore's law. Um, at the time that we did the first bacterial genome sequence. This was determining um, a genome that was just under 2 million base pairs of DNA sequence, and that cost nearly a million dollars. 
Um, again, today we can do millions of base pairs of DNA sequence for pennies. And so that has been a clear enabler. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, in the co for a long time, the cost was the limiting factor in really applying these technologies to the study of all life on Earth. But I think back to some meetings that we had with representatives from the various federal funding agencies, NIH and NSF and DOE, and this probably would have back, been back in the 1995-96 timeframe. And I remember the topic of one of these meetings was cost of sequencing aside, how many bacterial genome sequences did we think would be required in order to provide a new foundation for follow-on studies? You know, another way to think about it is how many, how many organisms would we need to sequence in order to have the genetic blueprint of most of the microbial life on Earth? And I, I like to ask this question particularly to graduate students and postdocs that are in the field now. And, you know, they come up with numbers like, oh, maybe 200 or 1,000 or, you know, somewhere in that range. <laughs> but the actual number, and this was a very, um, very high-level group of microbiologists that had been assembled for some of these conversations, the number was about a dozen because hmm. we were so unaware. The field was so unaware at that point in time of the diversity that existed among within bacterial life on Earth. And I would say that it was almost because of an accident in funding, and it was a mycobacterium tuberculosis project that the NIH funded our institute to carry out. And in the UK, um, the Wellcome Trust funded a group to sequence another isolate of mycobacterium tubercul tuberculosis, and cost was still a factor there. And everyone sort of threw up their hands and said, oh, no, what are we going to do? This is tr terrible duplication of effort. We're wasting money. We're not going to learn anything new. Well, both projects ended up being taken to completion. And when we compared the sequences of these two closely related strains of the same species, the number of differences blew everybody away. And I think that represented, that was probably in the late 1990s. And that represented a real turning point in our thinking about how many organisms needed to be sequenced and, and how valuable genomics could be in providing these kinds of parts lists for organisms of interest. That's really interesting. So you're talking about this evolution in sequencing technology. How has that impacted how we monitor the evolution and spread of pathogens? I think that we are now at a point where um, we see genome sequencing as, um, as a method not only for um, diagnosis but also surveillance. And it's really, I think, going to supplant a lot of the current methods that give you a fairly low-resolution picture of what's out there. Um, and I think maybe a really great example of how powerful these new approaches can be goes back now, uh, well, back to 2011. There was an outbreak of um, food poisoning around Germany. This turned out to be um, food poisoning e by a, a new strain of E. coli. It was thought that it was in a, um, a shipment of contaminated sprouts. Uh, and the epidemic ran its course over a period of about two months, and public health officials were trying to stay on top of it and were quarantining people and didn't know where, where the next outbreak was going to come from. But we got hold of um, a sample of material to sequence about midway through the time frame of the epidemic, and nobody knew how much longer it was going to run. And the question was, is this an E. coli that we've seen before, or is this a relatively new pathogen? The sequencing using the then current technology was completed in about three days. It was clear that this was a new, highly virulent isolate of E. coli. And um, the paper from start from the time that the sample was received until the paper in the New England Journal of Medicine was published was a period of about five weeks. Um, but the answer that this was a new strain of E. coli uh, 
had been achieved in less than a week's time. And again, that was back in 2011. The technology, both the sequencing technology and the analysis, the informatics technology has continued to evolve where we could do something like that now probably in 24, 36 hours. That's fascinating. So I know as a grad student, so um, a lot of the research that I did was on gene expression microarray. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we look at gene signatures that are associated with different you know, disease processes or different types of um, different types of tumors or, or whatnot. But there's an association there, but it wasn't necessarily a causation. Mm -hmm. So and I know you guys see a lot of that. You see a lot of um, bacterial communities that are mm -hmm. they're being proven to be associated with different disease processes. Um, how do we move towards causality when it comes to looking at these different bacterial communities and different diseases? Yeah, I think to me that that question, moving away from association to one of, of causality, is critically important. Um, and it's really difficult to do. Um, it, it, it doesn't mean that it's impossible, but um, you have we, there the, the number of diseases that have been associated with changes in the microbiome is growing ever longer. I mean, if it, I would say it, you'd be hard pressed to pick a disease, particularly a chronic disease, and go and do a Medline search and not find at least some small number of papers that have been published on changes in the microbiome associated with disease X, Y, or Z. Um, but how we move from that to causality is not entirely clear. One of the, one of the challenges is that we know that um, in an individual, as we talked about earlier, these communities are very dynamic. They change perhaps daily, maybe even hourly, perhaps in response to the last meal that we ate or the last stressful situation we found ourselves in. So part, part of what we have to get better at doing is defining what a baseline is. Um, maybe we can't define microbiome baselines in communities, but we can certainly try and do that in individuals. And then we really, I mean, really what you're asking, and I, and I think it's um, the right question, is can we find ways to apply Koch's postulates um, to the study of microbiome-associated diseases? In, in the infectious disease world, um, Koch's postulates were found to be absolutely essential before somebody could say that a pathogen was the cause of a disease. You had to find the pathogen in all cases of disease. You had to be able to isolate the pathogen, and then you had to be able to reinfect with the pathogen and um, end up with the same manifestations of disease. I think those are the challenges that we have in trying to make associations with microbiome and diseases. Um, and, and I mean, I think it's doable, and I think we're going to make the most progress, though, initially in various animal models of disease. And there are all, all sorts of caveats that come with studying animal models of anything, but um, you can do specific interventions, you can do, you can do fecal transplants in animals more readily than you can in humans for the purpose of trying to demonstrate Koch's postulates. And I think if we can make some progress there in the study of animal models, then we um, approach these same studies in humans and, and think about doing it in, a, in an iterative way, back and forth, I think, between human studies and, um, on, and animal studies. But it's going to be challenging, but I think that's, that's one of the challenges that the field has to be willing to accept at this point. And what, what bothers me a lot is when you read, um, sometimes in the science press, but almost always in, in the general press about a new association study that's now linked to change in the microbiome to a certain disease. Um, I, don't, I, I don't think the um, reporting is ever done responsibly enough to make it clear that these are just associations, and they're important. They, they provide the opportunity to generate new hypotheses to go out and test, but by no means are we um, anywhere near close to being done in in being able to say how the microbiome contributes to disease states. Yeah, you could probably say that across a number of different areas when it comes to biomedical research yeah. too, yeah. Um, so what are some of the new sequencing technologies that are on the horizon and what kind of benefits do they yield over current technology? Well, I think if, if I look back over the past 20 years and think about sequencing technologies, 
Um, we ended up back um, about 2000 with some very robust sequencing technology that gave us some very long sequence reads, which were enormously helpful in trying to put complex genomes back together again. Um, the challenge, though, was still the cost and the throughput. And new technologies, which at the time were called next-gen technologies, emerged that reduced the cost and increased the throughput. The trade-off, though, was that the read length was considerably shorter. It meant that we could generate a lot more sequence for the same amount of money, but qualitatively, these sequences were different and their utility changed. That we're now back in an era with um, technologies like the PAC biotechnology where we're back able to generate long reads. In this case, sometimes reads 20 or 25,000 base pairs long, which is enormously helpful in putting complex genomes together. These can serve as scaffolds. Um, but some of the other really cool sequencing technologies that maybe are not quite yet ready for prime time um, are technologies like the Oxford nanopore technology that allows you to sequence single molecules of DNA at a ridiculously low cost and do it in a platform that you could take out into the field, whether it be um, in a ro remote location to study a particular pathogen or out into the field to look at environmental organisms. This is a sequencing platform that you know literally fits in the palm of your hand and you can download the information that you get on a USB stick and, and, and think about analyzing it on a laptop computer. As I say, it's not quite ready yet, but I, I think that this will become a reality very, very soon. And just to think now that you can take this same kind of technology out of a lab and take it with you wherever you go is really going to revolutionize what you can use sequencing for yet again. What do you see as some of the data analysis challenges you face when analyzing this sort of data that you've, you've just described? I would say that um, with uh, genomics in general, all of the bottlenecks have now moved to data analysis. It used to be um, early on that it was sequencing throughput that was a bottleneck, then it was getting enough samples that was the bottleneck, um, but now it is absolutely the data analysis bottleneck. Um, and what, what we're struggling with currently, um, certainly when we look at microbiome data, is that we're collecting DNA sequence from these complex communities of organisms that are present at orders of magnitude different levels of abundance. And we have incomplete information on all but the most abundant members of these communities. So it, what we would ideally like to be able to do is take a DNA sequence read or an RNA-seq read and assign that with a high degree of confidence to a given isolate in the community and know exactly where that came from. Um, we get sort of close to that, but nowhere near where we would like to be. The other, the other challenge in data analysis, and this has been a problem from day one, and I don't see it going away anytime soon, has to do with all the sequence reads that we get that appear to be novel. We don't know where they come from. We don't know what organisms they were derived from. And that's just the nature of studying complex ecosystems. Not all of the, not all of the species have been identified, but yet through the power of, of genomics, we can get signatures of these organisms based on their, their DNA, but yet we don't really know much else about them. So um, if there was a way to begin to figure out how to bin some of these novel sequences um, in a way that would give us some insight into wh what types of organisms they may have been derived from, that would also be tremendously useful. Mm -hmm. Your work on the uh, and Mary Thrax investigation led to the identification of four genetic mutations in the anthrax spores that they were later then able to uh, trace back to the original source by virtue of that work. 
Uh, there must be a really interesting story in here somewhere. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. yeah, that was that was an amazing time, and it was such a valuable experience for my colleagues and I that got to participate in that. It turns out that when all of that happened, we were sequencing the first genome of Bacillus anthracis. It was on the list of priority organisms from the NIH, and we had been funded to do this genome. So talk about being at the right or the wrong place <laughs> at the right time. Um, and after, the, after it became clear that anthrax spores had been sent through the mail, um, an interagency working group on microbial genomics that had been set up to manage genome sequencing projects quickly mobilized and started to ask, is there anything that we could bring to bear um, using the tools of genomics um, to try and figure out the source of this material. And so because um, Tiger um, and my group was working on the, the anthrax genome, um, attention immediately turned to us. And so we were brought into a meeting. Rita, Dr. Rita Caldwell was mm -hmm. director of the NSF at the time. She's a microbiologist by training. So we were asked, were we ready, willing, and able um, to begin to work with the Department of Justice um, to begin to, to process some of these samples. And we really started to sit and brainstorm as to whether or not genomics could be useful in trying to identify specific DNA sequence variants in the spores that were sent through the mail that could really be used to identify the source of the material. Um, we, we, it, it, it turns out in both a good way and a bad way, anthrax, the anthrax bacterium is um, relatively um, homogeneous. You don't see um, lots of different mutations in this, and it was quickly determined through other methods that this was a strain of anthrax called the AIM strain that had first been um, isolated in 1981. So this all happened in um, 1990. No, this all happened in 2001, sorry. Um, and 20 years is a pretty short period of time when you think about um, how long some of the other bacteria have been around on the planet. Mm -hmm. So we, we didn't expect to find very many mutations. Um, and in fact, when we first um, did the sequencing of um, first sample that was sent through the mail, compared to a reference um, strain of the Ames anthrax, we didn't find a single base pair difference um, when we looked at more than 5 million base pairs in the genome. Wow. And we, we really couldn't believe it, but you know, we said, oh my gosh, is it really true that genomics is going to be a dead end here? Um, and we refused to believe that, so we, kept, <laughs> so we kept going. But what we were doing, and what everybody was doing at the time for all microbial genome sequencing projects, was growing up... Um, a liquid culture of your organism of interest and spinning down all the cells and getting a DNA prep that represented the DNA from all of the all of the cells in 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 that preparation. The breakthrough in the anthrax case came when um, an investigator at USAMRID was also growing some of this material by stringing it out on on plates and looking at individual colonies. And um, this was, I mean. This, this woman, um, Patricia Warsham, deserves tremendous credit for noticing that in these um, samples of material that were collected from the various letters, there were um, certain colonies, what became known as morphotypes, that had a different appearance than most of the other colonies on the plates. Hmm. And so we went back and sort of in our plan B or our phase two, we asked whether or not these different morphotypes were carrying changes in, in DNA sequence that could be used as a fingerprint. And so then we switched from looking at batch cultures to looking at individual isolates. And that's when these limited number of DNA sequence variants in the anthrax genome came to light and specific assays were developed based on those sequence variants. And then those were used to screen a repository of more than a thousand samples of Ames anthrax that the FBI had collected from labs around the world that had been known to have the material, and 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 that was the real breakthrough. That's awesome. Wow. Very, it was it was it was very cool, and um, uh, it was it was just it was 
it was an amazing experience in lots of different ways. You got to see the same science that we were doing applied to something in what really felt like a parallel universe, this whole area of law enforcement. Um, and you know, you like to think that you're always really careful in the work that you do in the lab. But what was made clear to us right from the very beginning was that we had to be absolutely sure about the data that we ended up um, sharing with the FBI because they were always intending that this would be information that they would take to a criminal trial. And so you certainly want, you certainly didn't want um, somebody's future in any way to be affected by um, by you know sequence errors that are probably there in every set of DNA sequence data, but most of the time don't really matter so much. Hmm. Just a different type of responsibility. Yeah. Very yeah. different. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a that's a stiff form of self inflicted peer review. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned uh, Rita Caldwell. Mm -hmm. She's a force of nature, and she uh, is indeed. Uh, she's a friend of uh, IHMC's. I worked with her for six years mm -hmm. uh, when she was the NSF director, and I was on the National Science Board. And she's on our Science Advisory Council, mm -hmm. and uh, just a bundle of uh, of energy and uh, uh, lots of focus. Yeah. Well, Rita has been a friend and a colleague for. Oh, gosh, over 20 years. And I just feel so fortunate that our paths have crossed. She has really been um, an extraordinary mentor to me. And, Absolutely. Uh, um, whenever, in, in the past when I've had questions, whether they be scientific questions or more political questions that I felt they needed some really strong advice on, Rita has always been the one that I've turned to. Good choice. Yeah. <laughs> So, Claire, a lot of your work has focused on the effects of antibiotics on the gut microbiome. Mm -hmm. Can you just kind of give us a basic description of what happens when you take an antibiotic and how that affects gut makeup? Most all of the antibiotics that are prescribed today are what are called broad-spectrum antibiotics. That is, they are effective against lots of different types of pathogens. And, and we use broad-spectrum antibiotics because we don't have great diagnostic tests that give immediate answers about um, what a particular pathogen might be for an upper respiratory infection or a urinary tract infection. So you need to be able to um, use an antibiotic that has a high likelihood of killing a number of different a number of different pathogens. Very often after three or four or five days, um, a more specific answer can be obtained, but nobody wants to wait that period of time before starting antibiotic therapy. Well, broad spectrum antibiotics are very effective against lots of different pathogens, but no surprise, they're also very effective against an awful lot of the bacteria that are part of the human microbiome. So when I think about antibiotics and the microbiome, I think of it as sort of being analogous to dropping a nuclear bomb um, on our microbial partners. And there have now been a there have now been a growing number of studies that have been carried out, which have shown that um, these broad spectrum antibiotics can have enormous effects. They can reduce overall numbers of bacteria by an order of magnitude. Um, and I think what's what's really um, come as somewhat of a surprise is that if you follow the restoration of these, um, if you follow the restoration of the microbiome over time, in some number of volunteers in these various studies, you'll find that in some subset of volunteers, the microbiome will end up restoring itself to look very much like what it did before the administration of antibiotics. The time course of that restoration, though, can vary. In some individuals, it can happen within a week or 10 days. In others, it can take several weeks or months. But I think what's even more concerning is that in a number of these studies, there have been a subset of individuals who have received antibiotics where the microbiome does not restore itself to the state it had prior to antibiotic administration. And 
these subjects haven't been followed for years and years at a time, but it's probably a safe assumption that that the composition and, and by inference, the function of, of the microbiome has been changed irreversibly. Mm -hmm. So if you think about this going on over the course of a lifetime, many, many times, and I, for one, could not tell you how many times in my life I've taken antibiotics. Yeah. Um, and and I, I ask that question often, and I've never had anybody raise their hand and say, I know how many times it has been. Um, so it may very well be that our exposure, both um, deliberate and medically indicated exposure to antibiotics to treat bacterial infections, along with unintended exposure to antibiotics that we know exist in the food supply, is driving the evolution of the human microbiome in a way that we don't necessarily intend to do. Mm -hmm. um, and my colleague, Marty Blazer at NYU, um, has written a fascinating book entitled Missing Microbes, and he's done some beautiful studies in mice, which suggest that um, over multiple generations, repeated exposure to antibiotics can result in decreases in the overall diversity of these bacterial communities, and these low diversity communities get passed down from one generation to another, hmm. suggesting that over the last many decades since we've been using antibiotics very successfully to treat infectious disease, we've also perhaps inadvertently been affecting the overall diversity of our microbiome. And, and you have to then ask the question, are there unintended consequences of messing with the diversity of this complex ecosystem? So um, talking about this, we see a transition to antibiotic resistant strains that you know evolve from generation to generation. Is there an epigenetic effect that we think comes into play between generations after antibiotic use, or is it specific to the gut? We just don't know yet, or I think I think that's a good question, but I would say we just don't know yet. Okay, um, and but I think it's something that we absolutely need to consider. STEM Talk is an educational service of the Florida Institute for Human and Machine Cognition, a not-for-profit research lab pioneering groundbreaking technologies aimed at leveraging and extending human cognition perception, locomotion, and resilience. So there have been a number of studies that have looked at fecal transplant for treatment of antibiotic-induced um, diarrhea and other types of gut dysfunction. What do you think it's going to take? One, do you think it's going to become a, a mainstay in the medical community? And two, what do you think it's going to take if, if it's going to transition as a mainstay in the medical community to get there? I would say that we probably have enough evidence already to suggest that um, fecal transplantation will become the standard of care for treating um, Clostridium difficile associated diarrhea. Um, there have been a number of clinical trials looking at fecal transplantation um, as compared with um, vancomycin, which is often sort of the last resort therapy that has been used to treat C. diff diarrhea. And in a couple of instances, um, clinical trials were stopped before they um, were completed because the difference in response rate was so dramatically different between vancomycin and fecal transplants that it was deemed unethical to continue patients on vancomycin therapy alone. Um, so I don't, I don't think that there's any or very little dispute anymore that fecal transplantation for that particular indication is the way to go. I think the bigger question is whether um, going forward this will continue to be fecal transplantation as it's currently practiced, um, or whether we can figure out what components, what, commun what microbiome community members in a fecal transplant are absolutely necessary to restore function. And there are a number of companies that have um, been established that are looking to see whether or not they can capture that kind of information and then move away from fecal transplantation, which is somewhat dirty in, in many respects, but it's, it's the variability 
from one donor to another that I'm talk- yeah. talking about, right. not, ne- not necessarily the procedure <laughs> itself, although there's an aspect of that as well, but to where you could then think about using um, good manufacturing practices to grow up the critical organisms and and put them in a capsule, just like you can buy certain probiotic formulations today in capsule format. And I think I think we'll get there probably sooner than you might think. And um, that's that's really tremendous. From your uh, perspective, do you think that the microbiome plays a significant role in obesity and in related chronic disorders uh, such as diabetes? I think the answer is yes, the microbiome plays a role. It may not be a singular role. Um, the data on the role of micro of the microbiome in obesity in mice is beautiful and clear cut, but um, as we know, um, studies in mice don't always extrapolate well to studies in humans. Um, and obesity is a complex disease in and of itself. Um, there are genetic components, and and I think as of last count. There were close to 100 different genes that had been implicated in obesity. The contribution of any one of these tended to be relatively small. So there's, there are underlying genetic um, factors. Um, there are certainly are environmental factors, um, and those environmental factors can very much impact the gut microbiome. There's the issue of physical activity. So when you think about trying to disentangle the contribution of the microbiome, which in and of itself is complex, and its role in a complex disease like obesity, I don't think it's surprising that we don't yet have a clear-cut understanding of what that relationship in humans may be. But I think we can get there. Um, I think we need larger studies with larger numbers of subjects over a longer period of time. Um, but but again, one of the confounding factors here in, in doing these kinds of studies in humans is the effect of things like diet. Um, you know, when you're doing studies with an inbred strain of mice and you can control the diet, you've, you've limited a lot of the confounding variables. When you're looking at unrelated human populations and you don't have any easy way to control um, diet and perhaps other factors that that influence the microbiome. You're trying to capture a signal about microbiome contributions um, in the context of a very noisy background. So I, I mean, I think we can get there. I think we just have to be a little bit more thoughtful about how we design these studies. What do you see as the best solution against antibiotic resistant strains? Um, just from your experience. Well, I, I mean. When when you're talking about antibiotic resistant strains at all, I mean it's antibiotic resistance is is out there, and in fact, antibiotic resistance probably derived from the fact that um, out in the natural world, bacteria don't live in isolation; they live in communities of interacting microbes, and sometimes these microbes carry out warfare against their neighbors. So um, a lot of bacteria um, produce antimicrobial compounds, peptides or small molecules that are meant to provide them um, a survival advantage when they're competing with their um, neighboring bacteria. So antibiotic compounds have been around forever. Antibiotic resistant genes develop in bacteria that you find out in the natural environment. So this is um, not necessarily something that we have created, but we it's something we have most definitely amplified. Um, so I, I, I don't think we can ever um, reasonably think that we're going to eliminate antibiotic resistance. At this point, the best we can think about doing is trying to contain it. And that is a tall order given the current state um, of where we are. Um, I think one of the most important things that we can do, and we talked previously about broad spectrum antibiotics, is really first make sure if antibiotics are being prescribed that um, healthcare provider is absolutely sure 
that this is a bacterial infection that's being targeted. Um, we as consumers have to play a role in that and not immediately run to our doctors and, and ask for antibiotics at the first sign of sneezing or sore throat, because very often those are viral infections. And I can understand frantic parents who have a sick child that want to make sure that that child is treated quickly, um, but antibiotics aren't necessarily the way to go. We also need, we need better and more precise diagnostics, point of care diagnostics, not diagnostics where you need to wait three or four or five days to get an answer. And ideally, we'd like point of care diagnostics along with more specific antibiotics. So if you know you're targeting pathogen X, you can go to your arsenal of antibiotics and, and pull out a compound that is effective just against pathogen X and not a lot of other bacteria. Um, that all sounds rational, I think, but um, unfortunately, uh, it's more complicated than just doing the science and, and developing all of these things. There's, there's also industry, pharmaceutical industry in particular, that needs to be incented to develop new antibiotics, and the value proposition for pharma just isn't there. Um, you know, the cost to develop a new antibiotic is probably on the order of a billion dollars. And knowing that we're going to probably forever be in a race with bacteria who have become very sophisticated in developing mechanisms of resistance, any new antibiotic is by definition going to have a limited time of utility in clinical practice. So there have been some interesting and I think important discussions about whether or not government needs to step in and, and help to fund some efforts to develop new antibiotics. Um, so it's, and it's an enormously complex problem. Um, and I, th I, I don't think anybody really fully understands what it would be like to get back to a situation that we were in, you know, not when any of us were alive, but back when, um, before we had antibiotics, um, you know, to see people dying of infections that today we just think are are eminently treatable, um, but it's 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 a situation. The idea of antimicrobial compounds and resistance probably goes back to when bacteria first appeared on Earth. So um, it's not something we're ever going to overcome. We just have to be smart about figuring out how to manage it. Hmm. You know, there's a uh, increasing evidence regarding a really significant gut-brain connection, implying a potential interaction between our gut and cognitive function and psychological states. And I was wondering if you could tell us more about the gut-brain connection mm -hmm. from your perspective and shed some light on this. Yeah, boy, I wish, I'm not sure I'm going to be very effective at shedding a whole lot of light on this. I think this represents the new and most exciting frontier in the microbiome field. Um, it's certainly known that there are lots of different connections between the gut and the brain. Um, circulating factors, the enteric nervous system, which feeds up through the vagus nerve to the brain and, and back down in the other direction, um, the circulating immune system. There are lots of points of connection. And again, where we are right now, I would say, is where we are with so much in the microbiome field. There are lots of intriguing associations that have been reported. Many of these have come from studies in, in mice and in germ-free mice in particular, um, where we know that altering the microbiome or looking at germ-free mice that have no microbiome and looking at various behaviors we can see that there are significant differences between conventional mice and germ-free mice. And you can intervene and give things like probiotics or prebiotics and see changes in mood and behavior in, in all of these mice. And we're starting to see some initial reports of, of similar findings in human studies. But as we've talked about before, human studies are, are very often confounded by all sorts of variables, many of which we know, some of which we, we may not know at all. Um, you know, I, as someone who has made a fabulous career out of genomics and has taken a very reductionist view of biology for a long period of time, thinking that if you 
generated a gene list. And, you know, this, this goes back to our first genome project. We really did believe that when we had that gene list for Haemophilus influenzae, we would be able to place every gene in a biochemical pathway and know how all of those genes work together to create a free living organism. And we were humbled and totally shocked when it turned out we weren't even close. Now we're, we're talking about one organism. But um, I think that what my work in the microbiome has really forced me to do, and I think this, when we think about the, the intersection of the gut and the brain, nothing drives this idea home more than that. But we really have to think of health and disease in a much more holistic way. And I think our naivete about all of this is even reflected in the fact that um, if you look at how NIH is organized, um, it's organized either based on disease or organ system. Um, there is a new um, institute, it used to be a center at NIH, um, that is taking a more holistic view, but that represents just a small part of the work that goes on at NIH. So I'm really excited about the idea that um, we may be able to intervene in various ways to um, affect mood and behavior, perhaps even mental illness, by targeting the gut microbiome. The path forward is not clear, and I think we want to be realistic to think that there won't necessarily be any major breakthroughs in the short term. But it may be that some of, some of the difficulties in treating certain mood disorders and mental illness um, reflect the fact that we weren't looking at, at this in, in a holistic way. We were focusing just on the brain, and there may be far more going on. And perhaps if we expand our field of view and our, our area of focus, um, I, th I think there's great potential to think that we have reason to assume we'll make some, some much better progress going forward. But as we've talked about with obesity, with other situations, now when you start to think about the brain and its intersection with the complexity of the microbiome, you've compounded the complexity yet again. So it, it for those of us, I, I would like to think that for those of us who are interested in these ideas, it's going to um, keep us in business for a long time to come because the answers won't be immediate. I think so. And the, the computational and other tools uh, will hopefully afford a possibility of taking a systems view mm -hmm. of these complex interaction and understanding it uh, in a way that we really can't without the tools. I hope that it, that it converges nicely. I think it will, and and I mean you you make you make a really great point um, that this is this is not going to be solved by the biologists alone. Um, this, if there was ever an example of a multidisciplinary project where we need to bring all these different sets of expertise to bear. Um, the study of the, the gut-brain interaction is, there's probably no better example. Yeah, it's a beautiful one. We have quite a few STEM Talk listeners who are deeply interested in traumatic brain injury. And I understand that TBI is strongly reflected in the microbiome. Could you discuss this a little? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, I've been involved in some very preliminary studies with colleagues at Maryland who have set up a mouse model of TBI. And what we've been doing is looking at the changes in the gut microbiome in these mice, in these mice following brain injury. And over a relatively short period of time, a matter of days, we see this wholesale change in the structure of the gut microbiome. Um, studies that my collaborators have done have also indicated that over this same short time frame where you see lots of changes in the membership in the gut microbiome, you start to see the integrity of the epithelial cells lining the GI tract um, become compromised. So it it's it's a situation that looks like sort of you know, the worst disruption of the GI tract that you could possibly imagine. And yet I think it really speaks to this connection between the, the gut and the brain. The injury was in the brain, and yet this is being translated into an effect in the gut. And when you start to see this breakdown um, in the integrity of the gut and the contents of the gut lumen now getting into the circulation, it just continues to drive 
the process of inflammation. Um, and so it, again, it leaves open the possibility that the gut microbiome may provide a new target to intervene to try and break this um, loop of inflammation that appears to be set up following brain injury. Mm, do we see uh, this increased intestinal permeability in humans with uh, TBI? I don't know. That's a great question, and I don't know that anybody has looked. Um, mm. uh, again, as, as part of this collaborative group at Maryland, um, we are thinking about ways that we can leverage the fact that we have one of the largest shock trauma hospitals right there at Maryland. Um, they admit more than 8,000 patients a year, and um, close to half of these um, patients come in with brain injury, usually from um, terrible accidents. Um, but uh, we've we've really tried to think how c can we can we make use of the fact that we we have these these patients there, and and let's just say this is still a work in in progress. But as we've talked about before, um, it's not always quite so easy to do the kinds of studies in humans that you would like to do and can more readily do um, in, in animal models. Mm, that one sounds important. Yeah, it sure does. It's really fascinating. And this goes back to the whole systems, you know, and mm -hmm. looking at things as a complex model, because the more we learn about like the HPA, um, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis and, and TBI, that's just barely been touched on. Mm -hmm. So then how does that interact with the gut and everything else? So it's really, really fascinating. Yeah. Um, so I know that you've researched how diet affects the microbiome. What have you learned so far? Well, let's just say I've learned enough to radically change my own <laughs> diet. Um, you know, if you think about um, the GI tract and the organisms that you find as you move down the GI tract, um, they really, it, it really does represent, it's a, it's a great example of coevolution um, and the the microbes that you find in the various segments of the GI tract are there, and they carry out very specific tasks um, that are critically important to enable us to digest the food that we eat. Um, I think some of the most interesting things that go on take place in the large intestine, where we see the greatest diversity of microbes, and it's where um, a lot of the complex polysaccharides that we eat when we eat fruits and vegetables and whole grains. That's where these um, foodstuffs get metabolized. And there are very specific organisms there in the gut that are designed to, to metabolize um, these complex molecules. We can't do anything about them. We don't have any of the enzymes that are necessary to break down these complex polysaccharides. But we know that if you feed these microbes in the large intestine appropriately, give them lots of fiber. They will ferment that fiber, and one of the key metabolites happen to be a collection of short-chain fatty acids. And, and of those short-chain fatty acids, they include acetate and butyrate and propionate. Butyrate is critically important. Butyrate is, uh, I would almost think of butyrate as being a wonder drug that our microbes themselves make. Um, it nourishes the cells that line the GI tract, so it helps to contribute to the integrity of that epithelial cell layer. Um, and the butyrate that isn't metabolized gets into the bloodstream and has been shown to have effects distally um, and probably, you know, we can go through them one by one, but collectively what butyrate does is to serve to dampen inflammation. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that's a good thing. And if you look at a lot of the chronic diseases that we suffer from in the developed world, they all have a component of inflammation. Diabetes, metabolic syndrome, atherosclerosis, some cancers, the list goes on and on. And, and one of the hallmarks of a lot of these chronic diseases is inflammation. So it leads you to, at least it leads me to ask the question, um, does that reflect some underlying problem with the bacteria that we find in the large intestine? So we know what we need to do to keep these bacteria happy. And if we do that, they in turn provide a great benefit to us. But I think you can flip that question on its head and ask, what happens if we don't feed them appropriately? And I will say, you know, before I started eating with my microbiome in mind, 
days would go by when, you know, maybe at most I might have a piece of lettuce and a tomato on a sandwich. And, and that would be the extent and of what, I, and ketchup, <laughs> and that would be the extent of what I eat. Um, well, these bacteria aren't going to go away. They're in your large intestine. They need to eat something. And if you don't provide them with what they need, they'll turn on you and start breaking down the mucus layer that provides if you will, sort of a layer of protection or a buffer between what's in the lumen of the gut and the epithelial cells. So they're going to feed themselves one way or another. We can either feed them what they want to eat, and if we don't, and they start to get hungry, they'll turn on us. And once that mucus layer thins, then it leaves open the possibility that your um, the epithelial cells in the gut are more vulnerable to attack. Um, and it's really no more complicated than that. So, um, you know, certainly, you know, certainly I, I, you, you talk to women who are pregnant and you'll see how careful they are about what they eat. And they'll say, well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm careful about what I eat and drink because I'm, you know, feeding my, my baby. Well, hmm. you know, I think we should all think about our diet in the same way that pregnant women do. Everything we put in our mouths, we're either feeding or not feeding our gut microbes. Mm -hmm. And it's not a mystery what we need to be doing to keep them happy and keep them producing some of these very beneficial metabolites. And, and I think that um, it now, it m probably more so than ever, it really saddens me when I look around and I see... Um, you know, what an awful lot of people eat. Mm. I mean, I have tried, I mean, you know, sort of one of my cardinal rules now is if it comes out of a package, you don't eat it. Mm. Um, these overly processed foods um, are, are, are just, you know, are terrible. High levels of sugar are terrible. Um, and I, I've become very, very interested, and this will be a long-term interest because it's not something that you can tackle with a single NIH grant, but the idea of food as medicine. Um, we just, we, we don't tend to think about that, but I think, I think the writing is on the wall and that we really need to start thinking about that much more seriously. I think a lot of our uh, listeners uh, share that view. And they're probably clapping right now. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, shared interest there. You know, for years, speaking of food, uh, dietary fat has been just demonized. Mm -hmm. And uh, you'll see this remarkably unhealthy stuff sold as healthy. And they'll say low fat. <laughs> and uh, everything else about it is truly awful. But it'll say low fat and be health food. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if, uh, you know, you could talk about this a little bit um, from a microbiome perspective. You mentioned a short chain fat earlier, mm -hmm. uh, butyrate. Um, so, could you talk a little bit about fat and dietary fat? Sure. Um, you know, I think dietary fat is metabolized in a different part of the intestine than than fiber. Dietary fat is metabolized in um, more so in the small intestine. You know, I, I just want everybody, you know, I just want to be careful. There, there are no absolutes, but th that's where dietary fat tends to be metabolized. There are subsets of organisms that are there. Um, and, and part of metabolism of fat is the secretion of bile, bile acids, and there are gut microbes in the small intestine that have evolved to basically detoxify the bile acids once they're done emulsifying the fats that we eat. So there's there's this wonderful compartmentalization of um, a function along the length of the GI tract and, and the microbes that we find in each of these areas of the GI tract are, are, are doing their job. The, the, the gut microbiome has beautifully figured out how to divide all the labor that needs to be done. And I think you know, I think the other thing that's important when we think about fat versus carbohydrate, um, and so often these low-fat foods are just loaded with sugars mm -hmm. and simple sugars. And I, I, you know, I've I've talked to people about this. You know, particularly my food is medicine um, mantra now. And you know, I'll hear people say to me, 
well, what difference does it make? You know, a calorie is a calorie is a calorie. And, and that's true if you're looking at what happens when you put food into a calorimeter I was and burn say, it. Yeah, if you're a bomb calorimeter, that's yeah. true. Thermodynamically, yeah. it's yeah. true in a calorimeter, yeah. but in the human body, nothing no. could be further from the truth. And, right. and um, it's, you know, it's the simple sugars in the absence of any fiber, the added sugars that, uh, you know, I think as, as you rightly point out and, you know, has now become more clear after a, more than a generation of, um, you know, all sorts of misinformation. Um, healthy fats, we absolutely need them. Um, it's, and it's when all fats were done away with and, and replaced with these simple sugars, you know, particularly high fructose corn syrup, I think that is very much what's been driving the, the obesity and diabetes epidemic more than anything, so... Absolutely. We have a, a, a guest uh, coming up shortly on STEM Talk, mm -hmm. uh, a, a repeat friend, uh, Gary uh, Tobbs, mm -hmm. and his new book uh, really um, does a beautiful job laying out the sugar story. Mm -hmm. And uh, it won't win them friends in some industries, but it's a nicely done piece of work. You know, I, 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 uh, I read it on a recent flight, um, start to finish on a flight. Um, it should be required reading yeah. for everybody. Yeah, he's an excellent journalist. Yeah, very good. So on a personal note, and you talked about this, you know, food is medicine mantra. How has all of this changed your personal diet? Uh, well, I would say that um, it my <laughs> what I eat now, I would say a meal doesn't go by that I'm not eating some significant amount of plants. Um, I have come up with this very, very weird breakfast smoothie concoction um, loaded with antioxidant fruits and flaxseed. And, you know, um, all I can say is when I don't get to have that for breakfast, I really miss it. And I start to feel not quite so good after a couple of days. Um, and, you know, I, I, I guess the one thing I will say is I, since I've been eating like this for a few years now, I feel better than I can ever remember having felt. And I just, I ask myself, I'm, I'm going to be 62 this year. And I ask myself, what if I had figured this out 30 mm -hmm. years ago? You know, how much, how much better would things be? Um, you know, I will also say we got, we were talking about this idea of the gut microbiome modulating inflammation in the body. Um, I played a lot of basketball when I was younger. Um, both of my parents had bad arthritis. Um, I am destined for one, possibly two knee replacements in my future. I know that on, on one knee I have bone on bone. Um, and I manage it because I'm not quite ready to have that surgery yet. Um, and it wasn't that long ago that I was taking Celebrex every day to try and manage the pain in my knee. And it was severe at times. Um, but since I've changed my eating, and I would like to think that I'm feeding my gut microbes all the things that they crave, um, the pain in my knees has, I won't say it's completely gone away, it hasn't, and, and it never will, but I'm off of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories except occasionally. And in fact, during that period of time, I did something that I always wanted to do but never thought would be possible given the knee, pa knee pain. And I've now taken up ballroom dancing and oh, I fantastic. do competitive ballroom dancing. Mm. And, uh, you know, and that's wonderful. And this is an N of one, which means it's an anecdote, right. I know. But I cannot attribute the change in my pain um, to anything else other than the, you know, the very... Um, clear change in my diet. Yeah. Well, diet affects everything. Mm -hmm. 2017 is a spectacular year to turn 62. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm sitting here right now, and I can say for both of you, I would guess that both of you are decades younger than that. So uh, <laughs> That's very nice. <laughs> <laughs> then when you said that, I was like, there's no way. <laughs> um, so we also have it on good authority that you make a very nice wine yourself. Oh, <laughs> Tell us about that. We have spies everywhere. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll say, boy, do you ever. Um, yeah, I, have st I, I started making wine back... Um, about eight years ago. I was, I love wine, um, 
I used to always be in the liquor store buying wine. <laughs> and I was in there one day um, and saw a flyer um, saying, do you like wine? Do you like to drink wine? Well, what, what about making wine? And so I hooked up with these two guys who work for the FDA. That's their day job. But they rent space in, they rent a couple of barns on a large farm not too far from me. And they have all the equipment. Um, so you sign up you know, for quarter, half, or full barrel. I don't know how many, I don't know how many batches of wine I've made. I don't, and I don't know how many hundreds of bottles of wine I have in my basement. More than I will ever probably drink myself, but that's why my friends know that there's never any question what they're going to get for a gift. <laughs> It'll be wine. But we've made some remarkable wine. And, um, you know, again, it's it's been an interesting experiment um, and I sort of approach so much in my life as an experiment because I've made made a number of Chardonnays and a number of Cabernets um, and a number of consecutive years. The grapes have come from the same part of the same vineyard, the same yeast strain, and yet it's remarkable to see how different the wines are one year to another. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's... It, it sort of brings in my microbiology exactly. interest and, um, you know, the fruits of the labor are, are pretty darn nice Fantastic. as well. Yeah. And you, uh, you you can complete the circle. It brings in your microbiology and you can feed it to your microbes. Absolutely. So Everybody's happy. It's good. Yes. Win, win, win. <laughs> Well, Claire, this has been a fantastic interview. We've really enjoyed having you here. So thank yeah. you again for Thank you. Us. This has been a lot of fun. Thanks great, for all Claire. the questions. Yeah. Thank you. STEM talk. 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 So I just have to say, Claire is awesome. I had heard of Claire when I was doing work in genomics at Duke. I know that she's made a tremendous impact on the community. And also, what about her experience with the Marathrax investigation? That's pretty cool. Cool indeed. She is an impactful person on several levels, and I might add, an incredibly fun and pleasant person. Yep. Claire was also an evening lecture speaker at IHMC. Her talk was packed, and it was evident that the audience loved every minute of it. For a link to her IHMC lecture, along with show notes for this podcast episode, I invite you to visit the STEM Talk webpage, stemtalk.us. This is Don Carnegie signing off for now. And this is Ken Ford saying goodbye until we meet again on STEM Talk. Thank you for listening to STEM Talk. We want this podcast to be discovered by others. So please take a minute to go to iTunes to rate the podcast and perhaps even write a review. More information about this and other episodes can be found at our website, stemtalk.us. There, you can also find more information about the guests we interview.